A week ago, Saturday, I was at a wedding reception, and uh, at that wedding reception, the best man, when he gave his toast to the bride and groom, he started by saying, to the groom, you know, it's no secret, you didn't like me very much when we first met, right? That's the best man to the groom. Well, you might feel a little bit that way about the spiritual rhythm that I'm going to introduce to you today. Maybe when you heard us mention solitude, you thought, solitude? I'm not sure I like solitude. I mean, isn't that what they use in the prison system, like as really bad punishment? Right? But what I'm hoping today is that you'll stay with me and that you'll hear the invitation to this spiritual rhythm that really, really has the power to be a good, good friend to you. And it goes by the name of solitude. Uh, my relationship with the spiritual practice of solitude, it goes back uh, many, many years. It was a little awkward at first. In fact, one of my very first attempts at some prolonged solitude uh, was years ago, I took my lawn chair, the folding kind, you know, they don't even make anymore, up to Irvine Park, and I'm going to sit in the park with my Bible, I'm going to be with God. And that all was going well until suddenly there's this blood-curdling shriek behind me that turns out to be from a peacock that had snuck up on me. Yeah, peacocks. It traumatized me so much I have not been back to Irvine Park, I don't think, since. Be that as it may, though, uh, solitude has become something that I depend on, uh, something that God has used greatly, greatly in my life. And, and, of course, not just me, all of the giants of our faith share this idea, the spiritual practice of solitude uh, with us. You can go all the way back to people like Moses, to the prophets in the Old Testament, you know, John the Baptist, to Jesus, especially Jesus, to Paul, and, and since then, all the way into our own day, those that we consider giants of the faith, they all have this in common, that they have found solitude to be a faithful friend and companion on the journey with God. So much so that it's not understating it to say that solitude is primary, it's foundational among the spiritual rhythms and disciplines of life. You can find lots and lots of people writing and talking about solitude all through the centuries, underlining how key it is um, to becoming the person God wants you to become. But today, I, I want you to hear the invitation that Jesus himself gives to his followers when talking about solitude. This is what Jesus said. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. That's the invitation Jesus has for you today. Solitude which is choosing to be alone with God. And the choosing part is what makes it different than solitary confinement, right? It's intentional. It's something that we decide and choose to do. And solitude is with God. Uh, that's what makes it different than just being alone. In spiritual solitude, we focus our minds, we focus our hearts and our spirits, we direct them towards God. And again, that's how it's different than just being alone or just being with my own thoughts, right? When I'm at home and I, I get burdened or overwhelmed, or I got a bunch of stuff that I'm thinking through, and I usually retreat into my garage, okay? Sometimes Anne sends me into the garage. And, and usually what I do in there is I just clean my workbench, right? And while I'm doing that, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm chewing, I'm, I'm processing, I'm, I'm working things out in my own mind. That's good as far as it goes, but that's different than the spiritual practice of solitude where I'm pointing my life to God and I'm opening myself up to listen to God. So hopefully this morning you'll hear this invitation from Jesus to come away and to get some rest. And what I really want to do this morning is I want to show you some of the power of solitude, what you can expect, what will you hope to find, what compels so many people to make solitude an important, a key part even of their spiritual life, okay? And there's lots and lots of things we could talk about today, but today I'm just going to give you four. 
four key reasons to pursue solitude or four things that you can hope for when you find solitude, spiritual solitude in your life. And the first one is simply this. In solitude, we hear God's voice. We hear God's voice. You know that God has a voice, that God wants to speak to you. Generally, He does not speak to us in an audible voice, but He speaks to us with an inner voice. In us, He speaks. What kind of voice do you think God might have? And sometimes when I talk to people about this, you think that, well, a loud, booming, thunderous voice is the kind of voice that would fit God, right? After all, He's God. But the reality is that the voice of God is quiet, so often gentle, like a whisper. In fact, that's what the prophet Elijah found. Elijah was a prophet, and one day he was having a bad day. He was whining about a whole bunch of stuff to God. And God said, you know what? Go stand on the mountain. Go stand over here on the mountain because the presence of the Lord is going to pass by you. And what happens then as Elijah's hiding out on the mountain is that there's this violent wind. that it, The Bible says it breaks apart the rocks of the mountain, but it says God wasn't there. And then an earthquake shakes the whole land, but it says God wasn't in the earthquake. And then this raging inferno of a fire goes sweeping across and says God wasn't there. But then it says there was a gentle whisper. Or if you have a, an older translation of the Bible, a still, small voice. And that's where God was. That's how God speaks to us. And how else are we going to hear the gentle whisper of God's voice if we don't quiet ourselves, if we don't get away from the constant noise, the constant input of our lives so that we can hear Him? When we pull away in solitude, it opens us up to the ability to hear God, not because God suddenly starts speaking, but because we start listening. And that all by itself is reason enough to make room in your life for this idea of solitude. Psalm 46.10 says this. We quote this verse all of the time. Be still and know that I am God. And if there's anything that afflicts modern, you know, man and our version of Christianity more than anything else, it's the desire to read this verse, to know God, but to omit the being still part. That somehow we fooled ourselves into thinking that we can know God without being still. Because we're not still, are we? I mean, I don't know about you, but... My life is full of noise, people, input, alarms, reminders, and distractions. And if I don't, in the midst of that, work intentionally to find this solitude, I won't know God. Because knowing God is more than just knowing about God. It's more than just the sum total of learning about God and the reading about God and the studying that we do, all of which is good. But God is personal, and He intends to have a relationship with you. And in order to do that, you must find yourself alone with God, quiet and still before Him, which is the uh, environment in which you best will come to know Him. Because in solitude, we, we work for that inner quietness, that stillness inside of us, okay? So, if our lives are constantly full of noise and distraction and we don't pull away, then we don't hear from God. But when we set this time apart from the distractions of our life and direct our hearts and minds towards God, then, then we hear from Him. And so we're going to intentionally focus ourselves on God, all right? So the other thing about solitude, in addition to hearing God's voice, is this. In solitude, we get clarity for decisions. So life is full of decisions. Have you noticed that? I mean, every minute, every hour, every day, they just flood our way. 
demands, requests, needs, things you have to choose and know and decide. And sometimes they fly at us so fast that we don't even recognize the impact that our ongoing decision-making is having on the direction or having on the course of our life. And then when big decisions come our way, we're, we're so stirred up that we find it hard to decide. You know, we're like the, the jar of water that's been filled with dirt, and the constant sloshing of the jar makes the water muddy. It's only when that jar comes to rest that the water clears, that clarity comes. And that's what God offers you in the spiritual practice of solitude, the opportunity to let the water settle, to let your soul settle, to let your body settle, and to find in that solitude clarity for decisions. Because, like we said, for one thing, you begin to hear from God. But also, when we are still and quiet and when we are in solitude, God works in us and and percolates up in us all of the things that He's been teaching us. You know, all of the stuff God's been telling you, all of the things you've been learning of Him, all of the things you've experienced of God. If we don't stop and get still, they, they don't get, uh, they don't rise up to the surface. They get held down. And it keeps us from being clear about direction or decisions. And solitude is a gift to us in that way, that it allows us to make big and small decisions. So, I don't know what decisions you might be facing today. Any good ones? Any big ones? Or small ones? But let me encourage you to seek solitude to find clarity. This is what Jesus did. In fact, we have lots of examples of this in Jesus' life. I'll just show you one because it's pretty important. Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, it says, One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Okay, that's Jesus entering solitude, right? He goes on to the mountainside where he spends his time praying and he prays to God. He does it all night. When morning came, it says he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And then those verses go on to name them. They're James and John and Bartholomew and people like that. But but I want you to see how important this is. First of all, this is a really big decision. Jesus has begun, by this point, his ministry. He's got disciples. He has people who are following him, and he decides that he's going to choose 12, 12 people who will become his closest followers. They will be the most intimate with him. They they will hear the most. They will see the most. They will know the most about the power of God at work in Jesus. And most importantly, these 12 will be handed the mission when Jesus dies, and it'll be up to them to carry it on. So it's a pretty important decision, wouldn't you say? And so before Jesus makes the decision, he goes into solitude. He spends the night on the mountain talking to God. And then when he's clear, he comes down and he makes his choices. That's the clarity that Jesus offers to you and to me. So maybe you're deciding about a major or or who to hang out with this year or or what clubs to join or what to do about a relationship or where you're going to live during this phase of your life or whether or not you should retire or how to spend your money or what to do with your neighbors this fall. All of those kinds of things require us to find solitude. And and normally what I find is the bigger the decision, the weightier the decision, the longer the solitude should be, right? That it should correspond. And so some decisions, uh, I can find clarity after 10 or 15 minutes of solitude and others might require several days of solitude to get clear on. But that's how it works. All right, the third thing that solitude offers besides hearing God's voice and getting clarity for decisions 
is solitude prepares us for challenges, the major challenges of our lives. Okay, I hope, first of all, that that's not news to you, that life is going to have challenges, all right? Okay, if you're more than two years old, you've probably already experienced this. But solitude, this being intentionally alone with God, it prepares us to face these challenges. This is what Jesus did. Notice what Jesus does at the very outset of his ministry. This is, I think, a very significant passage about solitude. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4 and see it. It says this. I'm going to read it, and then I'll tell you what it means, okay? It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And so these verses set up what we sometimes call the temptation of Jesus, the direct, intense, dramatic testing of Jesus by Satan himself. It's uh, it's an amazing encounter, and it's all about the mission of Jesus, because at this point, Jesus hasn't done anything. The only thing Jesus has done at this point, other than starting Christmas by being born, is he's been baptized by John, okay? He hasn't said anything, he hasn't given any speeches, he hasn't done any miracles, he hasn't described the life of God to anybody, he hasn't done anything yet, okay? And the first thing that's going to happen is he's going to be directly tested by the devil himself in an attempt to get him to give up his mission. So the devil's going to do everything he can to get Jesus to take a shortcut, to check out, to serve himself instead of others. Okay? But what I want you to see is how before that challenge, Jesus prepared for that challenge with 40 days of solitude. That's what Matthew clarifies for us. Jesus is alone in the wilderness, it says, And he's there fasting for 40 days. And he's fasting, so that makes him hungry, which is why the first thing that uh, the devil's going to tempt him with is, hey, let's make some food, right? But I want you to see that that doesn't happen. None of the tempting happens until after Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days. Sometimes I hear people talk about, oh, poor Jesus, Man, he must have been super weak. Just imagine how depleted he was, mostly because we're thinking about hunger, because he was fasting. He must have been really weak, and then the devil comes and tempts him. But what I want you to see is that the opposite is true. Jesus is actually at his strongest. Jesus is actually most ready to face the testing of Satan after being in solitude for 40 days. That's how Jesus prepared himself for the test that came, 40 days of solitude. Uh, As a side note, one of the things that makes solitude so powerful is that it, it can be a container rhythm, a container discipline. It can serve as a container for other spiritual practices. All by itself, solitude is is powerful in your life. But, but it can also be one of those places where you combine other spiritual rhythms. So in other words, fasting, that's what Jesus was doing. Fasting all by itself will have a dramatic impact on your spiritual life. But when you fast in solitude, the impact is increased greatly. When you pray, praying is an essential part of your spiritual life and development. We've already talked about that in this series. But when you go into solitude and pray, the impact of your prayer life is is heightened dramatically. And so that's one of the things you'll find people doing in solitude. They'll be participating in other disciplines at the same time. That's what Jesus was doing here. So to prepare himself for this amazing uh, test, what Jesus does is he goes into solitude for 40 days. 40 days. Because you're going to get clear on some direction. The stillness is going to percolate up the thoughts of God in your life. And your ability to see what's coming, the challenges of your life from God's perspective, come when we're in solitude. You'll be amazing, amazed to see how much more prepared you feel for your challenges, even if it's just five minutes in your car. 
solitude before you walk onto campus or you walk into your boss's office. You'll be amazed at what God will do. So, what challenges are you facing today? Will you consider Jesus' invitation to withdraw with him to a quiet place to help you prepare? And then finally, in solitude, we find strength. The strength to rejoin the battle. To re-engage the fight. Because sometimes the challenges in our lives, they aren't on the horizon. Sometimes you're right in the middle of them. And solitude offers us the opportunity to refuel or to heal or to take a deep breath before we re-engage the battle. It's like a soldier who is on the front line but then is always pulled back for a time of R&R before they are sent back into the battle. Right? That's part of the process of solitude. When we engage in solitude, we engage in the natural rhythm that God has designed us with. Work and rest. Right? Expend, withdraw. Stress, recovery. It's the way God has made us. We're not designed to be on 24-7. And it's one of the great challenges of our modern world. We've, we've come up with new and better ways to keep you constantly stimulated and engaged. And when you do that all the time, what you're going to find is the depletion that comes with not reconnecting with God. Even Jesus himself experienced this. In fact, there are lots of places throughout the New Testament where we see Jesus, after doing something stressful or expending a whole bunch of energy, he retreats into solitude before the next round. Here's one example. Uh, this is, we find this in um, uh, Luke chapter 4. At sunset, it says, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So this is typical Jesus. Lots of people around, real need, sickness, disease, illness, and Jesus is helping them. He's ministering to them. He's healing them. And it says that this starts at sunset. And apparently it goes all night because look what happens in verse 42. In verse 42 it says, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. This is, we see this a lot in Jesus' life. Jesus does something for people. He helps them. He does something miraculous, and then the people want him to do something else for them. They want to make him king sometimes. Uh, they want to stay and have a crusade, right? They want to make an Instagram story. They want to do something to promote Jesus. And so often the way Jesus responds to this is by saying, no, I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to go away into a solitary place to refuel, to regain, to be strong. Because that's one of the most important things that solitude does for us. Solitude helps us keep from being unduly controlled and influenced by other people and their expectations and agendas for us. I know this because I am somewhat susceptible to this, right? It's easy to get caught up in the desires and designs of other people in your life, whether it's in your family or in your ministry or in your job. But solitude helps us take a step back to hear from God, to let God set our priorities, right? To let God reaffirm the direction in our lives and to make sure that we're in touch with what we know to be true about ourselves. Here's Jesus right after he does one of his most famous miracles, feeding more than 5,000 people with a few uh, bread, loaves, and a few fish. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, after doing this amazing thing, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And even later that night, he was there alone. This is Jesus 
He's stepping back. He's withdrawing. He's expended a great deal of energy, and now he's refueling himself for the next round. He's not going to go on to the next step without some solitude, without some time with God, right? That's Jesus. He's practicing the rhythm of work and withdrawal, of being with the crowds and retreating into solitude. And this is what empowers him to keep going. And you'll find that a little bit of solitude, if that's not part of your life, it'll greatly energize the rest of your life. So around here, uh, Easter is a pretty intense time. It's the most spiritually intense time really at the church. I think it's because we talk so often and so much to so many people about the resurrection life of Jesus. And that always gets accompanied by a certain amount of spiritual warfare. And so every spring, uh, I go into solitude. I'll take a couple of days either right before Easter or right after Easter to recover. Uh, but it's all part of this, this uh, setup that God has of saying when you expend yourself, you must retreat into solitude to refuel yourself for the next uh, round. The best example of this comes at the end of Jesus' ministry. We looked at what he did before he started, but here's the very end of his ministry. This is Jesus. He's had his last supper with his disciples. He's on the verge of being arrested and tortured and crucified. Okay? And it's in that setting... It says this, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with them, and he, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. And going a little further... He fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from you, yet not as I will, but as you will. So this is Jesus about to face the culmination of his mission. He's going to give his life for the world, right? And before he enters into that final stage of his battle, he draws away. He takes his guys with him and he says, you guys stay here. I'm going to go over here. And then he says to three guys, you stay here. I'm going to go there. It's all a process of Jesus getting into solitude. And then he prays. And it is in that prayer that God strengthens him and fuels him for this final step because that's what Jesus is really saying. Hey, are we going to do this? Because if we are, I'm ready. But I need to know that you're with me. That's Jesus practicing solitude, and it is in solitude that Jesus finds his strength, the strength to do the hard thing, the strength to fulfill his purpose, the strength to stay in the battle. And Jesus invites us to do the very same thing, to find our strength in solitude. The book of Isaiah says it this way, in quietness, and trust is your strength. I'll tell you that's the opposite of the uh, voice of our culture that will tell you in your loudness and in your activity is your strength. But God works differently. In your quietness, in the ability to draw away, to be silent and in solitude with God, there you will find strength. And it is that strength that leads to confidence. So uh, tomorrow, the uh, executive team here will meet. That's me and Pastor uh, Heidi and Pastor Chris Steiger and Craig Davis are going to meet together, and there's going to be a little intervention uh, aimed at me. And they don't know that I know, so don't tell them, okay? Uh, apparently, uh, I've not exactly been myself lately. Maybe a little anxious, a little sad, a little grumpy. I know it's hard to believe, but because we're a team that's committed to caring for each other, we'll probably talk about it tomorrow. And one of the things that we'll talk about is the fact that I haven't been alone enough in this season. And so we'll make a plan for that. Because solitude and being alone with God is an essential part of the strengthening we need for the journey. All right. Are you ready? Willing? to try some solitude? Hopefully, in this series, we're inspiring you 
to take a new look at some spiritual practices and just work them into your life a little bit. And that's really what I'd like you to do with solitude. I'd like you to be thinking about some ways that you can work it into your life, maybe even this week. But before you do, let me, let me give you some thoughts because solitude is hard. It's hard to find solitude in our lives. And so my first encouragement would be to start small. Small, right? If solitude, if being alone with God is not yet a regular part of your life, then think in terms of minutes instead of hours. Daily minutes with God in solitude will change your life. And if you've incorporated that into your life already, then my encouragement would be to take a next step. Maybe you're ready for three or four hours of solitude. Maybe staying, remaining in your office after everyone goes home uh, just for a few hours to set your heart and to set your priorities before God and to let Him speak to it. Um, It could be as simple as taking the moment that you wake up when nothing else is stirring in your house and directing your thoughts to God and finding solitude. It could be maybe reorienting your cup of coffee in the morning and that ritual into instead of being something where you receive input from the newspaper or whatever, that you turn that around and say, I'm going to use this time to direct my thoughts to God and find some solitude there. There are lots of ways that you can find solitude. The second thing would be to find a place. Uh, the first place that I ever uh, identified and, and experienced solitude in was when I was in college. And I lived in an apartment, and about a half a block away from me, there was this little park. It had one picnic table, and that was it. But no one was ever there in the morning. And so I would just walk over there, sit on the picnic uh, table, have some silence and solitude with God, and then go on with my day. But what I found starting then, and it continues to this day, is that it's important to identify a place. You can grab solitude in the various rhythms of your life, but if you have a place, maybe it's a chair in a corner of a room in your house. Maybe it's a place outdoors, right? My favorite place these days is a little cabin in the mountains that affords me solitude. But having a place that you identify as the place to meet God will do a lot because you'll find that physically your body actually starts to settle into the rhythm of solitude when you enter that place, right? So find a place. The third part, third thing I'd suggest is the hardest by far, and that is to engage in solitude you need to unplug, okay? I know, and in our world, this is a significant challenge. I like to use the Bible on my phone for a lot of things, but when I'm in solitude, I don't do even that. You know why? Because I can be so easily distracted by that little box I hold in my hand. And so it's important to have a space in your life where you are unplugged from the constant barrage, the reminders, the notifications, uh, the beck and call of others. You've got to have a space in your life to unplug. And in order to do that, uh, you're going to have to prepare people. You you have to help the people in your life Uh, Be prepared for you to enter into solitude, especially if you want to try an extended time of solitude, like a night away or a weekend away. All the people who depend on you uh, will be driven crazy by the fact that you've withdrawn. I remember when my kids were little, it was like this instantaneous reflex. You pick up the phone and there's three children at your feet, right? You, You slip into the bathroom And what happens? All of a sudden, every child is knocking on the door of your room. That's just the way it works. It's no different with the people that you work with, right? Who've come to depend on you and they need your input and they expect things of you. All the various realms of our lives, you have to be um, overt with them about your need for solitude. When I'm on an extended time of solitude, what Ann and I usually do is we usually have one time a day when we check in with each other, but even that is risky 
Because if it happens to be the moment when the garbage disposal has exploded or all the children are in rebellion or whatever, it can have a major impact on solitude. So the last thing I would tell you is this, have a sense of humor. Learning solitude can be hard, so you have to be willing to laugh. There are going to be awkward and difficult moments. Sometimes there are going to be peacocks. That's just the way it is, right? And I cannot tell you how many times of solitude I have entered into and slept all the way through, right? That happens. That's just the way it is. You have to have a sense of humor because solitude is a gift. It's not a burden. It's not a regiment. It's a gift. Earlier this year, Craig Davis led a few of us on a retreat. We went to, a, to an abbey run by some monks up in Malibu, and they have a retreat center where you can go and have a retreat, and there's about five of us, and we went and decided to have a silent retreat uh, for a couple of days. And so we were um, out about on, on our own during the day. They have a lot of grounds there. It overlooks the ocean. It's really cool. By ourselves, silent. But we took our meals together with everybody else on the facility in the meeting room. And uh, we decided we were still going to be silent at our meals. The problem was not everybody else was silent. And in fact, uh, what happened the night we were having dinner there was that the monks were entertaining some donors. Okay, you could tell. These were people, they were trying to get to contribute a bunch of money to their abbey. And so what was happening is the woman who was the donor, uh, she was telling these very loud, obnoxious stories. Okay, they were not the kind of stories you would think to tell your priest or a monk. But the monks were obviously trying to raise money, so they are just laughing uproariously along, you know, kind of in a forced way with these people. And we're sitting there going, Really? That happens sometimes. When you want to have silence, the monks are making noise. It's just the way it is. <laughs> so embrace it. Embrace it, okay? And here again, this invitation from Jesus. Solitude, this choosing to be alone with God. Hear Jesus say to you today, come with me. Come with me. By yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. And I might invite you today to just decide on a step. Maybe this is so new to you that, that the first step would be simply to go home today and find five minutes to be alone and to focus your thoughts on God. Maybe you're in a routine. Maybe you're in a regular routine of time with God and it's time for you to stretch it. Maybe you'll think of a place that you can go. Maybe being outside would contribute to your solitude. And you'll ask, you'll ask yourself for three or four hours in your life. Or maybe some of you are ready for a longer, an extended time of solitude where you can regain your strength. And you know what? We would love to help you with that. You could ask me. Actually, you could ask anybody on our pastoral staff. We'd love to give you ideas about how to spend 24 hours in solitude or a weekend in solitude. Uh, it can be a life-changing experience, okay? So let's pray together. And as we pray, would you just consider your step, the way you might accept this invitation from Jesus to come away by yourself. We hear you today, Jesus. We've seen your example and we want to follow it. And we hear you graciously inviting us to come away free from the crowds. And we say, help us. Show us the way to come. Even in this moment of quiet, listen for the voice of the Lord and His encouragement to come.